so we have been looking at predictor collector methods or multi step methods for uh, solving od initial value problems and we looked at one particular class last time that was adams bashforth explicit methods so <coughs> what we have done till now is uh, multi step methods for solving od ivps and under this class i have derived uh constraints that need to be satisfied interpolating polynomial coefficients and from that we have derived a generic formula for arriving at any method and i'm describing some popular methods so one of them was uh so adams bashforth explicit adams bashforth explicit methods so these methods are uh multi step methods which only use certain class of uh or it only makes certain assumptions regarding what in the past you have to use so so it leads to uh the formula where you set alpha 0 is equal to alpha 1 uh sorry alpha 1 is equal to alpha z, alpha 2 equal to alpha p equal to 0 so we are not going to use past x values we are going to use past derivative values and it's an explicit method so beta minus 1 is equal to 0 and we set p is equal to m minus 1 okay the polynomial the the multi step p is uh number of steps is equal to m minus 1 m is the polynomial order which you have to fit okay so uh so we have p plus 1 additional equations and total number of constraints this is equal to total number of unknowns and this turns out to be 2m plus 1 where m is the polynomial order okay this turns out to be 2m plus 1 where m is the polynomial order so this is an explicit method <coughs> using this first constraint that is alpha i is equal to 0 to p alpha i is equal to 1 together with the assumptions that we are not going to use past x this implies that alpha 0 is equal to 1 okay and the remaining coefficients can be found out by setting up the constraints so i'm just writing the final form here
so I have to solve for alpha 0, I have to solve for beta 0, beta 1 to beta p. I am just setting up those constraints which we have derived earlier for the coefficients and then once I solve for this, once I solve for beta 0 to beta p and alpha 0, I get a particular method, multi-step method. The final form of this multi-step method would, uh, well one, one uh, assumption when I wrote all these equations, I forgot to mention. Uh, when we have derived those constraints on alpha and beta, okay, uh, we have made one assumption that is 0 raised to 0 is equal to 1. You get one term in that, in those constraints, 0 raised to 0. It is assumed that 0 raised to 0 is 1 for the sake of writing those constraints. So, whenever uh, I, I do not want to say anything about whether 0 raised to 0 is truly equal to 1. For this, these constraints, whenever 0 raised to 0 comes, substitute by 1. Okay? That is what makes it easy to write these constraints. Okay? Uh, do not assume that this is, this equality is, this is only for these constraints which we have written here. Okay. So, Adams Moulton explicit method finally would look like this x n plus 1 is equal to x n plus h beta 0 f n plus beta p f n minus p. Okay? The, the problem arises at time 0. At time 0, you do not know what are the derivatives in the past. One simplification you can do is that at time 0, you can use uh, all the past, you can, you, can, you can make an assumption that x 0 was the value which was also prevalent in the past. So, I'll, at all the past instances before 0, you can compute derivative using x 0. Okay. So, the problem will vanish after p steps. Okay. First p steps you will have problem because uh, or the other way to think about it is that you have to give first, you have to, when you initialize this algorithm, you will have to give p values, p initial values. Okay. One simple way of giving p initial values is to set them equal to x naught. If you set and you start integration from uh, p plus 1. So, you have to start your algorithm from p plus 1. 0 to p you will have to specify and those can be set equal to x 0 and then you can kick off your algorithm. After some time, okay, you will have past values and okay. So, <coughs> these are explicit algorithms. So, Okay, I just just uh, a correction. So here, this is not Adams Moulton. This is Adams Bashforth. Adams Bashforth are explicit methods. So these constraints here, these constraints here are for Adams Bashforth and Adams Moulton. Adams Moulton are implicit methods. Okay. So, so these constraints are same. We are not going to use past x values. Okay. We are going to use past derivative values. Okay. Uh, and we set p is equal to m minus 2 and well I uh, will not uh, set up the equations for beta 1, beta 0. So, you now the unknowns are now uh, bit, not just 
beta 0 to beta p, but these are implicit methods. So, beta minus 1 is not 0. Okay. So, the unknowns, well the first equation will give you alpha 0 is equal to 1. Okay. And you have to set up equations, remaining equations for beta minus 1, beta 0, beta p. You have to set up constraints for these and solve them. You will get a matrix equation in these unknowns you have to solve for beta minus 1 to beta p. Okay. It is an implicit method. So, you will get only difference between implicit and explicit method is you will have a of course, of course uh, this beta 1 to beta p which you get by this approach are will not are not going to be identical with Adams Bashforth. So, these are two different approaches, you will get two different set of coefficients. Okay. So, this will give you this will give you an implicit method. So, I will just go there and write it down. So, this is this is my x n plus 1 is equal to x n plus h beta minus 1 f n plus 1 plus beta 0 f n well just because you are using the same notation alpha beta or beta here does not mean these two will give you same this is this is Adams Moulton. So, this is an implicit method f n plus 1 appears here, here on the right hand side this is an explicit method. Okay. What is typically done is that when you want to solve or when you want to get the solution by implicit method okay, you use a corresponding explicit method to generate the initial guess because this is the iterative this has to be solved iteratively right. We saw this we have seen this in implicit Euler, explicit Euler. We use explicit Euler to initialize implicit Euler or trapezoidal rule. So, likewise in this particular case, okay, we are going to use this to give an initial guess, good initial guess for this. Okay. So, now this is done in two ways. Okay. One way is to do iteratively okay. and the other approach one way is to do it iteratively, the other approach is non-iterative. So, which means uh, you do a prediction and then you do a correction. Okay. So, I will just describe this prediction correction first. <coughs> okay. I am uh, so, this is one is non iterative method in non iterative method uh, you just do one prediction. So, my prediction is going to be x tilde n plus 1 is equal to x n plus h beta 0 f n I am calling this prediction as x tilde okay. and I am going to use this prediction to do a correction. Now, my correction is x n plus 1 is equal to x n plus h beta minus 1 f x tilde n plus 1. Okay. I am not going to do an iteration in this by this approach. I am just going to use x tilde n plus 1 which was computed here. Do it only once, substitute it here. Okay. Since this is now known to me, okay, I can compute this. Okay. Using this, I am going to compute x n plus 1. So, plus Okay. 
okay so if you do it this way only once it's non iterative okay this step is called as prediction step okay this is called as correction step prediction correction prediction correction okay suppose you don't want to you don't want to get into iterations at every point at least do a good prediction and do a correction okay well of course uh, best thing would be to do iterations so in that case the same approach can be used except except this this second part will be iterative okay so in that case the way i would change this algorithm is uh, for so this is non iterative algorithm iterative case i would call this i will go back here and call this my initial guess x not n plus 1 okay and then i will change this to xk n plus 1 and this side this is still prediction correction except now the correction is iterative okay and only first time this prediction is used as the initial guess next time this itself will feed it feed to itself and then you wait for the convergence to occur okay and uh, then we of course look at this x k plus 1 this to become smaller than some epsilon where epsilon is the limit 10 to the power minus 8 or something small number so <coughs> when you do prediction correction iteratively you use this only once the prediction only once and then you keep doing iterative calculation still you get convergence if you just want to stop with prediction correction okay that is also good enough many times and uh, you typically use same order algorithms for uh initializing so adams bashforth and adams molten can be used together in this prediction correction form okay there is one more class of algorithms now as i told you that adams algorithms which use past derivative values okay uh, what you should do of course when you write a program okay you should memorize past derivative values you can store them in some array okay or multi dimensional array and then you sh you should not compute it every time okay you should store it in the array and update the array every time you move in time okay you have to remember past p values okay when the new value comes the new derivative gets in old derivative goes out you can create a matrix kind of a structure and uh you can write an efficient algorithm for uh doing these calculations okay well what happens when you go to multi dimensional case where you have vector differential equation we use exactly same approach we use the same coefficients which are derived using scalar case and just instead of f which is scalar here we'll substitute by f which is vector nothing is going to change there are no separate derivations for the multi dimensional case okay multi dimensional case we just use the coefficients that you derive for the scalar case okay f here will be a function vector x here will be a vector x n plus 1 will be a vector and so on so that's the only difference which comes it when it comes to uh, multi dimensional methods now another class of methods like adams method another class of methods which are very very popular are gears method so gears explicit method and gears implicit method uh in gears method uh we do not use past derivatives we use past x okay 
we don't we don't have to save past derivative values we have to keep saving past x values anyway past x values we are saving because we want to see the profile so gears method are In gears explicit method, we put the constraints that beta minus 1, beta 1 up to beta p are equal to 0. We of course do not set beta 0 equal to 0. Okay. So, this, this method would look something like this that is x n plus 1 is equal to alpha 0 x n okay, plus alpha 1 x n minus 1 up to alpha p x n minus p plus beta 0 f n. Only one derivative value, the current derivative value at, at initial point okay. and then we use x n, x n minus 1, x n minus 2, x n minus p past p x values okay but this is an explicit method so only f n uh, yeah h correct yeah h times yeah you are right h times beta 0 f n okay um, as you can guess now gears implicit would be gears implicit would be beta 0 is equal to beta 1 is equal to beta p equal to 0. So, these are the constraints, these are the constraints. What is not 0 here is uh, beta minus 1 is not equal to 0. So, here you said beta 1 is equal to 0, beta 0 is equal to 0, okay. beta 0 equal to 0 up to beta p equal to 0 only beta minus 1 is not equal to 0. So, the only the way algorithm changes is x n plus 1 is equal to alpha 0 x n up to alpha p Okay. So, instead of h beta 0 f n which appears here, okay, you will get h beta minus 1 f n plus 1. This is an implicit method, explicit method. They can be tied up again if you want to implement gears method okay, in a non-iterative way. You generate x tilde n plus 1 using gears explicit, use it here and the, do the correction. So, prediction correction, non iterative. Iterative prediction correction is you initialize your algorithm using this and then solve this iteratively till you get convergence. Okay. And just to emphasize any of these algorithms, for any of these algorithms, if I am solving for dx by dt is equal to f of xt, where x belongs to R n and then we are starting from x t n is equal to x n, okay, where f is a function vector. All that I do here is if I just go back here, all that I do is here this will be my function vector f n, these all will be vectors alpha 0, alpha 1 are same, they are not different. Okay. Same thing here this would change to be a function vector. Typically, typically these iteratives, suppose you want to solve this iteratively, typically you solve it using successive substitutions. The reason being successive substitutions will, will give you a good solution or good, will give you conver convergence, 
uh, quick conversions provided you have a good initial guess and we assume that we have a good initial guess because of this. So typically it will converge. Okay? You have a good initial guess and you don't have to see the advantage of simple successive substitutions is that you do not have to compute derivatives. Right? No derivative calculations in the world. It is just generating a guess and putting it back. And so those are derivative free uh, methods which are computationally less intensive. So you would solve them using successes of substitutions. Okay. So as I said, uh, these are two popular schemes, Adam scheme and gear scheme. Okay. One can create one's own uh, mix. You know, you might say, well, I don't like only derivative values are only x values. I want a mix of few derivatives and few and you can you can do that. You can choose to uh, generate a method of your liking uh, and develop your own program, develop the coefficients, find them for once and develop a generic program in which you would integrate your differential equation using uh, your own recipe for, okay. Just remember what we have, what we have learned is how, how to arrive at integration algorithms or how to arrive at uh, algorithms for solving uh, OD initial value problems. Okay. Uh, either through Renge Kutta class or through multi-step class, predictor character class. Okay. Any one of them will uh, and then multivariate case is uh, multivariate case is simply as I said uh, we use the same coefficients as the univariate case and then uh, instead of derivative uh, scalar derivatives we will substitute by derivative vectors and you get the algorithm. The third method which I uh, promised to do in the class but I am going to leave it more as a reading exercise because I want to move on to something else is orthogonal collocations because we have looked at orthogonal collocations very much in great detail. Okay. I will just give you an idea what is done now and then we will move on. Uh, the details are there in the notes, you should read this okay. because uh, it is just repetition of what we have already learned about orthogonal collocations. We have learned about orthogonal collocations in the context of solving boundary value problems. Okay. Now I want to use orthogonal collocations idea in the context of initial value problem. Okay. That is the difference. I want to use it in the context of initial value problem. So, in the same class that is uh, except one thing which changes here is that uh, the philosophy changes though is in the same class of interpolating polynomials. We are still going to use interpolating polynomials. Okay. But when you use orthogonal collocations in some sense the philosophy is similar to Renge Kutta methods. What happens in Renge Kutta methods? What is philosophically different between multi step and Renge Kutta methods? See, in multi step methods and Renge Kutta methods, suppose you are going from, uh, from time step n to n plus 1, this is n minus 1, this is n minus 2, this is n minus 3, in multi step methods we used x n minus 1 x n minus 2, x n minus 3, derivative values at these points in the past. See this is my this is my current time, this is future and this is past. Okay. In multi step methods we used derivative values or we use the uh, x values in the past. What happened in Renge Kutta method? In Renge Kutta method we created some intermediate points okay, and then we evaluated derivatives at those points. We never worried about what happened in the past. Okay. We moved from xn to xn plus 1 by doing some intermediate calculations. Okay. And what happened in the past is all contained in xn, we did not bother about uh, using it again. Okay. What happens in orthogonal collocations is somewhat similar to what happens in Renge Kutta. In orthogonal collocations, we are going to still use 
polynomial interpolation. The idea of polynomial interpolation remains there because it's orthogonal locations. Okay, except I am not going to use pass now. I am just going to use from here to here. Okay, so what I am going to do now is this section. Okay, this section I am just blowing it up. This is my time n or this is my time t n or integration instant n and this is n plus 1. Okay. Now, what I am going to do is uh, I am going to use shifted Legendre polynomials or the, the roots of the shifted Legendre polynomials at uh, over this interval, but the problem is this is not 0 to 1. Okay. So, what I have to do is to transform the time axis using tau is equal to t minus t n divided by h where h is my integration interval. Okay. And then I have to say that I am I am standing here at n. So, I know x n which is same as x x tau is equal to 0 x n is same as x tau is equal to 0. Okay. And then I am going to place the collocation points now at the roots of the suitable shifted Legendre polynomial inside inside this interval. Okay. Suppose you place them at uh, you know third order polynomial then this will be the first root will be let us call this Okay, I am going to place roots at tau 1 which is equal to 0, okay. tau 1 equal to 0, tau 2 equal to point 0.11, one. we have seen these roots 1, 1, 2, 7, okay. point 0.1127, one, one, tau 3 equal to point 0.5, tau 4 is equal to point 0.8873 and tau phi is equal to 1. Okay. Tau phi is equal to 1. So, I am going to place these knots. Okay. What is the solution? The solution is the value of x at tau phi. This is x n plus 1. See, my x n plus 1 where tau is equal to 1 that is equal to tau 5 t is equal to t n plus h which is equal to t n plus 1. Okay. So, once I reach once I reach tau 5 okay, I get the solution okay. and <coughs> so, what I do here is so, I am defining this intermediate variables x 1 is equal to x at time 0, uh, let us call this by some other notation say z 1 is equal to x at time 0 which is same as or x at tau equal to 0 which is same as x n right initial point. Okay. Uh, then uh, and I am going to call 
z2 this is x at tau equal to tau 2 z3 is x at tau equal to tau 3 and so on okay my aim is to find out z5 which is aim is to find out z5 which is x tau equal to 1 which is x n plus 1 this is what i want to find out okay now what i do is i have this differential equation dx by dt okay dx by dt is equal to f of x t okay f of x t how will you transform this to tau so t is equal to or tau is equal to t minus tn by h so d tau is equal to or h d tau is equal to dt right so this equation this equation will become dx by 1 by h d tau is equal to f x tau h plus t n right tau h plus t n ok and this is my h I am just going to multiply this h on the right hand side so I will just say d x by d t is equal to h times this now how do you how do you use orthogonal collocations yeah this d x by d t you have to convert ok dx by dt you have to convert using this s and t matrices ok and then uh, instead of instead of working with uh, sorry one one mistake i made here this should be dx by d tau this should be dx by d tau and then instead of working with x we could work with z ok so i could work with new notation z ok then all that i need to do is to set up these equations that is si transpose z is equal to h Okay, where i goes from 2, 3, 4 and 5. We have taken, see there is one difference here. Okay, in the, when you go, when you were solving boundary value problems, okay, you had to use two boundary conditions. Okay, here we have to use initial condition. So, you cannot set derivative at time uh, tau equal to 0, because at tau equal to 0, you know the value of z1 z1 is equal to xn okay we know that z1 is equal to xn this value is known okay so what is this vector z here z consists of five elements z is z1 z2 z3 z4 and z5 out of this z1 is known what are unknowns z2 z3 z4 z5 Okay, what is the solution finally when you solve this is z5 because z5 is xn plus 1. Okay, so you set up these equations. These equations could be nonlinear equations. Okay, they could be nonlinear equations, they could be linear equations, depends upon what is f. If f is a nonlinear function, these will be nonlinear algebraic equations. They have to be solved using Newton Raphson or Newton's method or whatever, some iterative method. Okay. The difference is even though you are using interpolation polynomial, you are doing function evaluations at intermediate points, at different intermediate points. Okay. Uh, oh, this is tau i, h tau i. And tau i, we know what are tau i values. 
tau y values are roots of the shifted Lie general polynomial. So those things we know. So these are these are at intermediate points. We do the function evaluations. We solve this set of nonlinear, typically nonlinear algebraic equations simultaneously. And when you solve it, okay, the final value that is z5 will be uh, z5 will be your solution. Okay, how to get the how to get uh, how to modify this for the vector differential equation? I have discussed in the notes. You can just go through it. Uh, slightly becomes slightly complicated, but not too much. Here, of course, you have to solve these algebraic equations, and there may not be a good initial guess. In which case, you have to solve them using derivative-based methods. Okay, uh, there are uh, good collocation-based packages available. Um, Carnegie Mellon University has put up a package. Professor Bigler has, from Carnegie Mellon University has put up a package on uh, solving large number of differential equations using orthogonal collocations. You can just uh, download, set up your problem, give number of grid points. It will do all the calculations for you. It will also, it has a solver inside which will uh, solve. Of course, uh, these things you can use when you go to your projects. Now in the course, you should not download the package. You should program yourself to understand what is going on. So what is going on is, uh, you know, uh, intermediate calculations going from n to n plus 1. Okay. So in some sense, philosophically what is happening is similar to that of the uh, Renge Kutta methods. We are not going to use past derivatives. Okay. Now, um, so with this with this method, okay, we have a wide variety of approaches for solving uh, ODE IVP. Which one do you use? Okay, so there are hundreds of methods now, not just one. Renge Gutta is a class of methods. You can derive third order, fourth order, and here uh, that too within each order. Depending upon how you choose the free parameters, you will get one method which belongs to second order Renge Kutta class or third order Renge Kutta class and so on because there are always free parameters as you have seen here also. There are free parameters. If you set certain things equal to zero, you will get some constraints and then you will get a method. So there are so many of methods, many, many methods. We need to get some insight into their behavior, their convergence behavior. What is convergence? First of all, uh, I need to know if uh, in certain situation I know the true solution okay, and then I construct an approximate solution using one of these methods. How close is the approximation to the truth? That is one fundamental question. Okay. And related to this question is how do I choose okay, interval of integration? How do I choose my interval of integration? H is the most difficult part in solving ODE IVP. Okay. So we will get some insights into this in next one or two lectures as to how to exactly go about choosing, selecting H. Okay. So if you are willing to choose H to be very, very small, even simple Euler's method will work. Okay. But sometimes Okay, this small becomes too small and then it is not useful. Suppose you are doing dynamic simulation of a, of a chemical plant. Some differential equations act on a very fast time scale. Some differential equations act on a very slow time scale. Choosing one H, okay, which will, so you may have to choose H to cater to the small time scale, fast dynamics. You may have to choose H very, very small, you know, milliseconds. And to cater to dynamics of temperature in a furnace, you may have to choose H to be one minute because nothing happens in one hour, you know. So how do you choose H? If you start choosing millisecond, you will have too many computations. If you start using minutes, you will miss some dynamics. Okay, so there is a balance. And how do you how do you go about choosing integration step size? These analysis of integration step size gives us insight into uh, you know some uh, comparative behavior or some relative behavior of each methods 
okay at the end of it i am not going to prescribe one method ultimately when you actually start solving real problems you will develop your own uh, preferences okay some of you will start using rangakutta some of you will start using multi step and you will know how to tweak the free parameters or how to choose the integration interval appropriately so that you can make your algorithm work okay so uh, there is no one unique uh, you know recipe which will solve all the problems okay so you will typically develop your own uh, solutions uh i'll just mention one approach before we move on to actually getting insights into uh integration step size okay so this is called as a variable step size approach i'll just mention this <coughs> now before i move to variable step size approach is orthogonal collocation idea clear i have just sketched it here i have not derived all the equations the equations are given in the notes and we have looked at orthogonal collocations thoroughly for boundary value problems only difference here is okay we are solving it for we are using it for initial value problems okay so just have a look at uh, okay so uh let's look at this variable step size implementation the detailed algorithm i'll describe the next class i'll just give you the philosophy is let's say you have reached up to this point you have started from time t equal to 0 and you are at point tn and of course you have xn with you and then you want to move and make the new step okay you want to make a new step variable step size implementation idea is possible only with runge kutta class of methods okay not possible or only with uh, the methods in which you are marching ahead in time you are not going to use past information okay multi step methods variable step size doesn't uh, doesn't work or it will need lot of work to make it work in variable step size here uh, in runge kutta methods you are just marching from tn to tn plus 1 okay so the philosophy is very simple now what the question is i am not going to fix h okay i want to move from tn to tn plus h what should be h okay what should be h what i do is a simple idea okay i choose some h some guess h okay and then i make one move from here to here okay i make one move from here to here assuming that step size is h then what i do is i assume that step is not h but step is h by 2 okay so i make two moves from here to tn plus h by 2 okay and then from here to here so this is this is this is h by 2 and this is h okay now if the solution i obtain by making two steps and by making one step is not too different then i accept that h okay you get what i'm saying see what i'm going to do is in variable step size implementation i don't know what is the step size to choose is it 1 minute okay or is it 10 seconds okay let's say i start with a guess of 1 minute okay so i i make integration from tn to tn plus 1 minute okay then i go from tn to tn plus half minute tn plus half minute to tn plus 1 minute i go to the end point once in two steps and once in single step okay then i compare the result if the result is too different okay then i say well i don't accept this initial 1 minute i'll reduce it to 
I will reduce my step size to T n plus h by 2. Okay. Now, what I will do is I will go in one shot here to here okay, and I will go hopping twice. Okay. Compare the results. If these two results are similar, I accept it. If not, you know, I shrink this further. Okay. So, I take some initial step size. I go there in two steps. I go there in one step. If the two solutions are very, very close, I accept that solution. If the two solutions are too different, I shrink the step. Okay. I reduce the step. So, I might start with one minute as my step size and I might reduce it to half minute, okay, to quarter minute, to one eighth of a minute till I get this, you know, two solutions matching. One step solution should match with the two step solution. Okay. So, this way, if you implement Lange Gutta method, you have a very robust method. You don't have to worry about how to select the step size. It will keep doing lot of calculations. It will keep doing lot of calculations, but those calculations will help you to give a robust algorithm which will not fail. Okay? We will describe this algorithm in detail next class and we will also get insight into what really matters. Okay? Well, unfortunately or fortunately, again what will reappear is eigenvalues. Okay? And they will again help us to find our way out. Okay? So, let us look at uh, the convergence aspect in the next class.